Welcome to the Neon Noise Podcast, your home for learning ways to attract more traffic to your website, generate more leads, convert more leads into customers, and build stronger relationships with your customers. And now, your hosts, Justin Johnson and Ken Franzen. Hey, 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 Neon Noise Nation. Welcome to the Neon Noise Podcast, where we code marketing and sales topics to help you grow your business. I am Justin Johnson. And with me, I have my co-host, Mr. Ken Franzen. Ken, how are you doing today? Doing great, Justin. Just uh, getting ready for this time change coming up. Uh, it's dark yeah, in the mornings. It's really dark. And I'm not looking forward to it because that means it's going to get dark early. And uh, I think they said last night somewhere I read that in a couple of weeks it's going to be sunset at 530. Ooh. And that's just a, a little <laughs> not quite ready for that yet. But uh, hey. I guess we got to get the shorter days before we can start creeping up to the longer days and the warmer weather, at least up in this region of the country. We don't get that beautiful weather. Uh, yeah, the weather's guys, changing down here. It's, it's awfully nice in Florida right now. So um, I feel that. But uh, longer days will be nice. So, anyhow, let's get going. Today we will be speaking with Linda Desso. She is the founder of Content Master Guide, where she helps wellness clinics and their practitioners attract new clients. Her You Talk, I Write blog writing service and blog editing service has helped her clients get better leads and clients through inspiring and educational content. A highly regarded expert when it comes to the blogging field, she has spoken at numerous conferences and publishes a blog with tips and tricks for business owners on her website, contentmasteryguide.com. Good morning, Linda. Welcome to Neon Noise. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Linda, do me a favor and fill in the blanks on anything I may have missed and share with us a little bit about your background. Oh, you did great. I've been uh, helping other people with their online content since 2004 and uh, launched this business in 2005. And in 2010 is when I really honed in on blogging as my area that I most loved helping people with and also just found so much potential for for business owners, you know, just to be able to share their expertise, help their audience, and build up that credibility, you know, by doing that. So it really became my my little area of, of the huge marketing puzzle that I, that I wanted to solve. <laughs> That's great. Linda, we talk about this almost ad nauseum, but I, I loved this conversation because I still think that blogging something that I hear – two sides. I hear there's so many people out there blogging. There's so many bloggers. The blogging market is absolutely saturated. And then I turn to a lot of business owners who aren't participating in the blog content creation, uh, the act of blogging at all. And so while there are a lot, there are many that aren't. And so I wanted to just, let's start off, just kick this off with why blogging is so important. Why why should it be a key component of a marketing strategy? Well, it's it you know, it's true that there are a lot of people out there. There are a lot of voices, it, there's a lot of clutter, there's a lot of bad content, which is a really good opportunity for someone who's committed to writing good content. Um, and the reason it's so important is because it really creates a conversation with your perspective clients, your prospective audience. And, you know, I like to, I mean, if I like to talk about when people ask me about SEO, I say, yes, great. Yes. Blogging can help your SEO. And let's talk about some ways that blogging actually can help you without SEO. And I have this blog post on my site. It's all about, you know, here's how to um, build your business. Google not required, you know, with, with blogging, Google not required. Cause if Ooh. you think about it, like, yes, it's great to be discovered by well, a stranger. That's Absolutely. That's fantastic. But, you know, really it's not the stranger who's going to be your most, um, you know, ideal client or your most likely client. So, you know, so I talk about three scenarios, the first way from one friend to another. So if I'm looking for something, and particularly I, I work with a lot of wellness practitioners, so it's a very personal service, but really any kind of service-based business. If you're going into someone's home, if you're going to be um, performing some kind of very personal service to them or with them, um, or, or business service as well, like you want someone you can trust. You want someone who's you know, who, who has some kind of connection with you, hopefully. Someone you know has either worked with them or somehow has endorsed them to you. So 
from one friend to another, if you're looking for something, you're going to ask your friends and your friends are going to say, hey, go to this person. Or maybe you don't actually have a direct conversation with them, but you see that your friend is sharing stuff from this other person. You say, oh, I see that so-and-so shared an article from that, you know, landscape or from that massage therapist, or maybe that's somebody I could check out who could help me with my needs, you know? So from one friend to another, you know, Google's not required for that. It's just your friend either telling you about somebody or sharing something that that person has written, something like a blog post. Uh, Next, you've got from one expert to another. So if I'm an expert in blogging per se, or you guys with your mar- with marketing, inbound marketing. So people are looking to you for um, other recommendations in that space. And they look to me as well. You know, so if I'm following another expert and sharing stuff from that expert or having them onto my podcast or having them onto my blog as an, as an expert that I'm interviewing, you know, that's, that's exposing my audience to this expert and and we can do that as well for our own businesses. So today I'm lucky enough to be chatting with you and having this great conversation which hopefully will be giving excellent information but it's also allowing me to meet your audience and if they have a need for what I offer, great. So blogging helps you to you know to connect with other experts to have a reason to connect with them. So if I want to if I want to find out more about an expert, if I want to, you know, connect with them, a great way is to reach out and say, hey, can I interview you? Um, and then, um, so, so yeah, so another, another expert endorsing you, either by interviewing you, having you um, participate in their content, or just having you share their stuff, that is um, showing their audience that you're also an expert, a related expert in what they do. Um, and lastly, getting checked out. So, so once somebody hears about you from one of their friends or from another expert or a colleague, what's the first thing they're going to do? I mean, it's go to your website. So they go to your website, they see blog or they see articles or they see latest news or however you decide to call your blog where you write about, you know, what you do and how you can help. And they're going to go there and they're going to read what's there. Hopefully they're going to find a lot of great content. And they're going to be reading one post and there's going to be links from that post to another post. Or at the end of the post, it's going to say, hey, read more about this. And there's going to be four more posts they can read. And next thing you know, five minutes has gone by and they're still on your site. Maybe they'll want to find out more about you. Maybe they'll sign up for your newsletter. Or maybe they'll just remember you the next time a need comes up. So those are three ways that, you know, blogging can help your business. Google not required. I like that a lot because a lot of the main, I think that one of the main drivers behind blogging with a lot of business owners is the goal of increasing their search engine exposure. And I think sometimes that comes at the fault of writing for the search engines and not for the target audience. Mm -hmm. And so these three points, yeah, these three points are really, really great because it gives us this, this focal uh, point that is is different than I think what uh, we've really looked at before. Now, let's say we have a business owner listening. There, you just inspired them that they are going to and and embark on this blogging journey. What would be the first thing? Because this is the question we get all the time. That's great, but I don't know what to write about. What would be the the first thing that you would recommend a business owner write about, or how do you? Approach approach or coach others on topic creation or, or, or just what uh, they could, should focus on? That's a great question. And it's an important question. And and I encourage everyone not to just jump in willy nilly, willy nilly, but to have a plan. So I teach people a four step planning process, which I'm happy to go through with you now. Uh, People can also download it from my website, uh, contentmasteryguide.com forward slash plan, but I'm going to tell you all about it right now. So um, the first step is to look at your goals. Why are you blogging to begin with? You know, what is your, what is your end? Um, Do you want to demonstrate your expertise? Do you want to show people that in whatever industry you're in, you are an expert, you have the credibility and the capability to help them solve their problem? 
Do you want to educate, inspire your audience? Do you want to get wider exposure for your business? Of course, you probably want all of these things. We all do. But think about which are most important. And also be really specific. So when you're coming up with your blogging goals, think about, okay, I want more clients. Well, we all want more clients. How many more clients do you want? Like just, just throw out a number. Just be specific. And also um, you might want more subscribers on your, new, new, your newsletter list because we all know that newsletter email is a very effective way to make contact, to further the relationship, and eventually, you know, make an ask, you know, make, you know, give them lots of value, lots of this wonderful content. And then you can say, and by the way, um, you know, hope you've learned a lot from this content. If you don't feel comfortable tackling this yourself as a DIY, or if you've tried and you need a bit more help, we're here to help you. So once you have that relationship and you've given that value, so yeah, it might be to build up new subscribers. So how many? Just, you know, have a goal. Goals are really important because that helps us to measure how we're doing. And it also gives us a reason to keep doing it because otherwise, believe me, blogging is not the easiest thing to keep up with for myself as well. So, you know, we need to have that reason so that we can keep tapping into that and inspire ourselves. Um, the next step, and you, you talked about this, like, what do you blog about? So the next step is really, really important. And it's deciding what are your five to seven topic areas or categories? What are those going to be for, for you, your blog, your business? What do you want to be known for? What do you want people to equate with you and your business? So think about the services you provide, the particular um, target groups you might be working with, or you know whatever, whatever the topic areas that you know the most about that you want to be known for, that you have value to provide, and that people are looking for, that, that solve a problem that people actually have. So, you know, choose five to seven, not too many more than that, or it gets overwhelming and cluttered, and you don't want to have too few because you want to give yourself lots of different things to write about, and you want to give people, you know, enough information. So I've got everything you need to know about categories in a blog post that I wrote, contentmasteryguide.com forward slash cat for categories. Um, just go there. It's a complete guide to choosing the best categories for your blog. And again, these topic areas, they extend beyond your blog. So when you're on social media, for example, and you're you know, sharing things that other people have written, like from, from either major media sources or from other experts, Whatever the case, you want to make sure that what you're sharing has to do with one of those five to seven topic areas that, that you've claimed. Because you want everything you do across the web to come back to those areas. Because you really want to be known for that. And you don't want to distract people or have them wondering what you're all about or have them forgetting what your core focus is. So you want to keep, like I say, everything you do on the web, you want to come back to those core topic areas or categories. So once you have that, you know why you're blogging, you know what you're going to be blogging about. Um, now you want to create some kind of plan or calendar. They call it an editorial calendar. So that's where you decide, okay, um, I'm going to post, you know, once a month, I'm going to post twice a month. Maybe when you get really comfortable with blogging and start posting once a week, I don't suggest you start with that because uh, until you get the hang of it, it's going to be really intimidating and overwhelming. So start with once a month, start with twice a month, see, what, see, how, you, see how you go. Um, and the other thing about planning with a calendar, so yes, you can plan out, here's what I'm going to write about this week and here's what I'm going to write about in two weeks from then. But also what you can think about here is what type of posts you're going to write. So this is a big um, area that I like to teach people about because most people think that when they write a new blog post, it has to be this like epic content. We hear about this epic content, viral content, long form, 3,000 word, you know, everything you need to know about X. And you know what? That's the clearest, surest way to burn out uh, from blogging really, really quickly. <laughs> and so I actually suggest, I'm kind of giving you all my, all my answers to the, the frequently asked questions in the first, you know, 15 minutes here. But, sure. you know, I, I suggest when you're starting 500 words, that's your like sweet spot for a, 
a feature article, a how-to, a DIY, you know, here's how to do this. Um, whatever, you know, depending on what kind of business you have, whatever your ideal client is struggling with that you can help them, you know, here's how to do it. 500 words. See how that goes. And then I say, okay, so maybe do those, do one of those once a month. And then if you want to do a second post that month, or eventually if you get to posting three or even four times a month, uh, you can write different kinds of posts. They don't all have to be a full-length article. The next one could be maybe, you know, you're writing about something else that you saw on the web. You're kind of doing a commentary or just like letting someone know, hey, here's a really great piece I read about this, you know, this thing that's important in our industry or this task. Um, that you, this job that you might want to do. Here's a really interesting way of looking at it that so-and-so wrote. And maybe spend, you know, a paragraph or two talking about the expert, talking about who wrote it, how you discovered them, why you think they're even worthy of, of looking at. So, hey, you know, I've known this person for a few years. We connected at a conference. Um, they helped me with such and such, or they helped someone I know. Um, here's an article that they wrote you know, about this particular topic. Um, I thought it was really interesting because X, Y, Z. Or you could even say, you know, I agree with this. I didn't agree with this. What do you think? Like, just kind of give your own commentary. Don't let them forget that you're the expert. You're an expert uh, and you're sharing this other piece of content with them. And then, you know, you're the one who discovered the content and you're the one who's telling them why it's so great. Um, so, you know, that's like, maybe 250 words or 350. That's a much shorter effort or a shorter number of words that you need to put out with, put out, you know, put out. Um, another type of post that might be easier or shorter could be um, a post about someone else in your industry or, you know, similar to what I just talked about, but without the link maybe to someone else's post. You could interview the person or you could just simply talk about them and maybe link to their website if you want. But you know, it's just giving people a resource. So it could be a product or it could be a person. It could be, you know, depending on your business, it could be a product that you've used and recommend, something that you use in your services that they might want to know more about, a vendor that you deal with in your company that they might be curious to know more about. Uh, it could be a profile on one of your staff or one somebody uh, that you work with in your business. Just something that's, you know, just telling them about someone or something that they need to know. And again, this could be shorter, could be easier to produce because it's not all coming from your head. It's not all, you know, here's what you need to know about this. It's like, hey, here's a person. And then you're getting the person, you know, by telling, you know, talking about the person. So you're, you've got the facts right there or you've got that person to collaborate with you to create the content. So just a few different ways that you can create a blog post that doesn't have to be about you um, sharing your expertise. I mean, you definitely want to do lots of that. But not every time you write something does it have to be one of these full-length articles. And I think that's something that intimidates a lot that are getting started. I like how you encourage the slow start, smaller posts, less frequency, because I, I, I look at this as kind of a, a muscle that you need to build, just like an exercise routine. Mm -hmm. And if you start going to the gym two hours a day every day, <laughs> you will be burnt out by the end of the week. You will hate the gym and things will not be uh, rosy as you had originally planned. Um, what should I, if I'm, if I'm getting ready to create my editorial calendar and I'm going to put blocks of time in my calendar, how much time are you spending on a, and I, I the, the types of posts you just described vary in, in time commitments and in research and writing, but on average, what would you say that you would spend on a 500-word blog post just to give a frame of reference to someone considering, okay, great, this is what my current calendar provides me. Uh, I can put a block here and a block here and a block here to devote towards this. So what I actually, that's a great question, and I won't give you my answer because, I mean, I mean first of all, every blog post takes me a different amount of time, and second of all, you know, I'm coming at this, like I've been writing blog posts for, you know, many, many years. So it's going to be different for me. Um, but I would just say what I recommend is actually setting aside a little bit of time every day. 
So, and the reason I recommend that, and I have a whole blog post about that as well. It's like, I call it your daily blogging habit, you know? Um, and there's a lot of reasons I recommend that. First of all, it's, it, it gets, like you say, it gets easier to do something when you build up the muscle. So if you spend 15 minutes every day doing a little bit towards a blog post, it's going to be easier and less intimidating than saying, okay, I've got two hours. I'm going to start it. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to publish it. I'm going to promote it. And then I'm done. You know, right. it, it may be appealing in some ways because you get it all done. But boy, that's a marathon. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a marathon blogging session. And honestly, the quality is not going to be as good if you do that because you're not going to have time to think about it. You're not going to have time to read it over. Um, you're not going to have time to get all the, the different pieces together that you might need. Um, so I really strongly recommend that you not try to do it all in one sitting. So I break it down into seven steps, actually. I, we can go into that if you like, my seven Please. steps. Please. Yeah, so, um, so I break it down into seven steps. Sometimes you might do one step every day, and other times you might combine them. Like, I often combine them, but again, that comes with experience as well. Um, but also, like, if you're in a flow, you definitely want to you want to do as much as you, as you can. Um, what you, what, where I find that the steps really help is the more stuck you are. <laughs> so the more stuck you are, the, the better it is to say, all I have to do today <laughs> is find a photo. You know, that's all I have to do today. So that's when it becomes, you know, really helpful to, uh, to have those steps in place. Cause you can kind of get yourself slowly into, um, you know, slowly into the, into the process. And then you can say, okay, I did it. Now I can, now I can stop for today. Um, and, uh, and that can be, that can be great. That can be really encouraging. So, um, the seven steps, the first one that you do is brainstorming. So here's where you're looking either at your editorial calendar um, you're thinking about your seven, five to seven topics. You're thinking about conversations that you've had in the last week with some of your clients or potential clients. You're thinking about things you've seen on the news or, or at a conference or on TV. What, you know, just, you're just brainstorming. You're just thinking about all the ideas you can think of and just dumping them down onto a piece of paper or into a document and just kind of getting, getting them all out. Um, the next step, is outlining. So that's where you hone in and say, okay, of all these topics, here's the one that I feel most juiced about writing. Because that's the thing too. You want to feel some sort of enthusiasm or excitement or confidence about what you're choosing to write about. You don't want to just write something because that happens to be on your calendar or that happens to be what you said you were going to write this week. You can always set it aside and come back to it. Um, for the most part, your audience, you're not publishing your calendar. They're not going to see what's coming up. I, I do not recommend saying, next week, we're going we're to talk about X, if you haven't written the post yet. <laughs> if you've written the post, then go for it. Or if it's a two-parter that you're doing and, you, you know, you've already got the, the skeleton of it, then go ahead. Otherwise, I do not recommend doing that because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, you can always add it in later. You can always say, hey, you wrote about a related topic and here's the link. You can always add that back. But otherwise, I don't recommend doing that because you don't want to box yourself into a corner and, and force yourself to be writing about something that you're not, you're not feeling and you're not um, inspired because that's going to come across in the quality. So once you've honed in, you said, okay, this is what I want to write about this week. Then you do step two, which is outline. So uh, again, you're not writing at this point. Don't worry. You don't have to write anything. You're just going to outline. You're going to say, okay, uh, what are the main points I want to cover here? Am I going to write, is this a top 10 list or a top five list? You know, so what are the five things or what are the 10 things? Or what's my main argument or my main point? And maybe some, you know, three sub points. Like, so just kind of a basic outline of what you're going to cover in your post. So that's the second, the second step. Uh, the third step, and again, you might want to flow right into this, or you might want to come back to it the next, the next day or the next week, you know, whatever works, whatever's working for you. That's the draft. So that's when you're actually starting to write now. <laughs> so you're going to fill in the holes, fill in the blanks. You've got your main points, your, your list, if you're doing a list, 
And now you're just going to fill it in a bit and say, okay, what, do, what does my audience need to know about this? Or what else do I have to say about this? Or maybe pull in some research if you've done some research. You know, what are some quotes or some statistics or something that you're bringing in uh, to supplement your own, your own expertise? So just kind of drafting it all out, putting all the pieces together. That's your draft. So by the end of that, you're going to have, you know, a rough, very rough draft of your article. The next step, number four, is shape, shaping. So here's where you're really kind of pulling it together, making sure that your your what you've actually written answers the premise or the promise that you've put into the title. Uh, you might still be tweaking your title. title. In fact, you're you're definitely going to do that in this in this part. So in the shaping process, this is where you're finalizing your title and saying, okay, what am I trying to say, and and what what appeal is this going to have to my audience, and what words are going to show them. That, that this is what they want to read in order to solve this problem or to satisfy this curiosity or inspire them or educate them, whatever you're trying to do. So that's where you kind of tweak the title and then make sure that the article is actually answering that question or promise and, you know, um, look at your introduction, your conclusion. And again, asking yourself the same questions for the introduction and conclusion. So what are you trying to tell people? What's important for them to know? What do they want to walk away with? You want to be bringing all those kinds of questions and answers into the introduction and conclusion because that's where you really, you know, you grab people and say, hey, yeah, I do want to know more about that. Or, hey, I didn't realize the impact that was having, you know, whether you share a statistic or ask a question, tell a story, like, you know, depending on the problem that you're solving, you know, you may want to describe, you know, what life is like for someone who has this problem. Um, you might, you know, somehow get that across in your introduction and then the, in the conclusion, very similarly, you know, so we've been telling you about this, you know, here's, here's why we wanted to tell you, here's what we told you, and here's what we suggest you go and do about it, <laughs> you know, so maybe some kind of action. And that action could be to read something else that you've written about it, or it could be to contact you. Not every time, you don't want to say that every time, but it could be. Um, or it could be some kind of exercise you, you're going to suggest them the, that they do, some kind of task or um, process that, that you're suggesting that they take as a next step. So all of that, you know, what you're doing in the shaping process, really bringing the article together, making sure that it, it's cohesive and it comes together. The next step is my favorite because I love doing it, and it's one of the most important ones, and it's one that most people leave out. Any guesses? Hmm. Photos. Nope. <laughs> That's ah, number six. Swings and misses. <laughs> <laughs> One more guess and then I'll tell you. What do most people not do before they publish a blog post? Proofread? Hey, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> All right. It's the editing. I'm batting 500. Yeah. You're good. I'm, it's, I'm... it's the editing stage. So that's where you're editing and proofreading. So, and they're really two different things. Editing is, is, you know, you're really, again, kind of like what you were doing in shaping. You're kind of making sure everything's coming together. And you're also making sure it's readable. So, um, you know, I, what I like, my favorite way of editing is reading out loud. So I sometimes read it myself, but more often than not, I use the text-to-speech on my computer. And it's kind of fun because it's not me. It's, and in fact, I actually use a male voice just because then it's even, I'm even more likely to notice if it's, if it doesn't sound like me because inside my head is what sounds like me. And sure. I can be reading something, even if a female voice is reading it or I'm reading it. And I still see what I want to see versus what's on the page because I know what's supposed to be there. So I'm going to fill in the missing words. I'm going to skip over the, the typos. You know, but if I'm hearing a male voice read it, somehow it just really helps me to spot things. Um, repeated words, run-on sentences, uh, errors, you know, it really, really helps me. So that's what I do for, for the editing is, is I, I hear it out loud. I make sure that it sounds like me. It sounds like how I would talk to somebody about the topic, not like how I would write. <laughs> because, you know, often we write differently and we write... We want to sound smart. We want to use big words. We want to use a lot of jargon because we think that it makes us sound like more credible. Uh, but if you hear how it sounds out loud, how you might say it to someone, then that really tells you that you're that you're 
you've produced something that someone's going to have an easier time accessing, you know, and, and it's going to be more, you're going to make use feel more approachable. And it's going to, most of importantly, it's going to get the information across. Because when you, when you use the big word and when you have errors or typos, then that's going to block your message. That's going to distract somebody from getting your message. So you want to clear the path so that all, there's nothing between your message and your reader. So that's what editing and proofreading really does. Clears the path to make a simple connection for your reader so they can actually get your point. They can get the information that you're trying to share with them. Very, very important. Okay. So the next step is the one that you mentioned, which is decorate. So decoration now. You're going to decorate your post with a photo. So um, you want to find a photo. There's different, different ways of going about choosing your actual photo. First, I'll just say, you know, what not to do here. Don't Google um, picture of X uh, and then choose the first one that you see. Because more than likely that image is it belongs to somebody else it's on their website they own it you don't have permission to use it so and i'll say something else there are very unscrupulous people out there uh in in internet land who have placed photos that they know people are looking for in so that they'll be found in these searches they wait for you to take it put it on your website and then they come after you with um with they threaten legal action if you don't pay them you know, X number of dollars uh, because they've copyrighted. I'm so glad you brought that up. Pardon? I'm so glad that you brought that up. We've talked about this in the past quite a bit and people just don't realize the uh, negative effects of doing that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, so yes, you want to protect yourself against lawsuits and, and really, really expensive uh, mistakes. But as a, as a writer myself, I, I, I mean, my where my heart goes is you don't want to steal something someone else has produced. Like you don't, you know, I'm a content creator. So you want, I, I, you know, you want to have respect for other content creators. So that's always my primary, you know, um, argument or rationale for, for encouraging people to do it the right way is, you know, you want to, you want to showcase people who've created content, and you want to uh, honor and respect them and not, not just use their work without their permission. So, so you look for royalty-free image. You look for, um, yeah, royalty-free. That's or, or you look to purchase a license. So um, you, can, you can look at, there, there's free sites, lots of free sites out there. There's Creative Commons. That's another thing you can look at, which gives you very specific guidelines how you can use the photo. Um, so some people might be, go ahead, use it however you like. You don't have to give me credit. You don't have to, you can change it. You can have it on something for sale, whatever you want. Others may have more strict guidelines. You can't use it for commercial use. You must credit me. You cannot change or modify the image. So you need to be sure of, of what you're buying or what you're using and what permissions that you have. Um, so, so absolutely. So um, I've used uh, photolia.com a lot. I've used deposit photos. Um, I have used, um, let's see, there's, I don't have it in front of me, but there's, um, there's a lot of different ones. You can, you can search and you guys might have recommendations that you can share. Um, so once you find a, a reputable site uh, and you know that you can, you know, um, get, you know, you can use what you're finding here. As far as searching for your image, so sometimes you might want to be literal and you might want to actually have a picture of whatever it is you're talking about. Um, other times you might want to tap into emotion. And, and I think more often than not, that's a really effective way to go. So think about the person who has the problem that you're solving with this article. And think about, you, you can either think about how, they'll, how they feel when they have the problem and you can kind of um, show like, you know, cause I've done this a few times. Like if I'm talking about writing clearly, I might find a picture of somebody looking at a computer and looking really confused because, <laughs> you know, it, it just kind of taps into that. And this is what you don't want. You don't want your blog reader to look totally confused when they're trying to read your, your post or look around your website. So, um, or you might want to find a picture of, of the, the after, like the solution, when the person is um, 
happily have happily solved their problem, this is how they might look, or this is the expression, or this is um, you know this is a picture of them, you know, like with whatever it is that they've that they've accomplished, you know, behind them. So, so yeah, so that's just one one way of looking for images is to tap into the emotion. Um, so, and other than that, I mean, the whole purpose of having is an image is to, is, is to catch someone's eye. So you do want to find something that's eye catching, especially on social media. When you're sharing a link, it's so much more appealing and, and attention grabbing if there's an image attached to whatever it is that you're sharing. And in this case, you're sharing a link to a blog post. So you want to have that image there that's going to grab their attention and say, hey, you know, why is that person confused? <laughs> or, hey, why does that person look so happy standing in front of their, you know, freshly manicured lawn or <laughs> whatever it is that you're blogging about? So, sure. um, so that's, that's the, se- the seventh step. So, sorry, the sixth step. We have one more, and that's the seventh step. And that's tease, the big tease. So in this step, and I encourage you to do this while you're in the writing process and not later as kind of a separate project. And this is where you're writing the teaser text that you're going to use on social media. Like I talked about having the image there. That's great. But you also need to have some words. And the title of your blog post might be some one of the things that you share, but it's not necessarily the most um, captivating. So I suggest that you write a series of messages, especially for a site like Twitter, because you're probably going to want to share several times um, about this particular post because things move so fast on Twitter that people may not see it the first time or the second time. So I suggest that you write a series of messages. Also, you want to write a series of messages for the different platforms. So you don't just you know, create one and put it everywhere. Um, you want to create different ones for the different settings. Every um, social network has a slightly different culture and in some cases a very different culture. Facebook is very different from LinkedIn and Twitter, of course, has the character limit, although I've heard that it's, <laughs> that it's expanding. I'm not sure when, is that, when that's rolling out for everyone or for anyone, but uh, in the meantime, there, there are character limits to Twitter. I don't think it's ever going to be as long as what you can do on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, and, and again, it's just a different culture. It's a very different culture. So you want to be writing something that's appropriate for each of the platforms and not just sharing automatically. I strongly recommend disabling any kind of automated posting that you may have going on with your blog or, or your website. Uh, there's plugins that do it also within um social media networks, there's ways to do it. You know, you're posting on LinkedIn. It says, hey, you can also post this here. Um, I suggest not doing that. First of all, uh, it makes things look really automated. If someone is checking you out and they're checking out all your different platforms and they just see the same message repeated everywhere, um, your platforms are like your website in a way. Like people are going to check you out there too. And they might be sitting there because they want to know more about you. They're going to look. First at your website, then at your LinkedIn profile, then at your Twitter profile, then at your Facebook page. And if they see the same thing all the time, repeated, 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 it just makes it look like you're just calling it in. You're not making any effort and you're just posting things automatically. You're not really showing up there. So um, definitely uh, vary what you're posting. Vary the times if you can as well. So again, they're not, if someone is following you in a bunch of different places, they're not just seeing, oh, it's eight (laughs) o'clock. There's all your messages coming, coming in my, in my different, uh, on my different screens. Um, As far as writing the teaser posts, um, so I suggest that you look at, so you can start with the title, certainly, and the title might be a good, a good place to start because hopefully you've crafted a title that does speak to the benefit of why someone's going to be reading it, what problem that you're solving. But you might also then look in your introduction. Introductions and conclusions, if you've written them the way that I suggest, are great places to find teaser text. Because it's where you've kind of summed up things and where you've kind of, you know, you're kind of captivating people to keep reading. Um, So these are great places to find your teaser text. Also, just look in the body of your post. Look for quotes, you know, interesting quotes you might pull out. 
maybe one of the statistics that you've shared, if you have any of that. Um, just little little quotes here and there that just kind of capture the meat of the post or make people really curious about, you know, what's what you're talking about there or what, what, else, what else did they did they say about that? You know, just think about different ways um, that you can tease people to want to, to want to know more. As long as you're actually delivering, you don't want to use what they call the clickbait, which is where, um, you know, it, it sounds like something that they want to know about, but when you, when they get there, you're not really answering that question or, you know, it's, it's something completely different. So those are the seven steps. I love it. What would you recommend as far as a number of uh, teases to create a Twitter, the feed, you're right. The feed moves very fast. And, and I don't think that uh, any of us can wait until uh, we get to 280 characters because i think we're all excited for that even though <laughs> once we get there we're gonna be like this isn't enough but at any rate I, you know twitter the feed moves very fast you, you and because of that you you feel the need to feed the feed more uh than maybe facebook or linkedin but how many teases would you write for each platform yeah definitely it, it definitely um depends on how active you are like, for example, I, so, so typically what I do is three tweets um, and then just one each for Facebook and LinkedIn um, until you know how the post is doing. Like if a po- when a post gets really popular, then, you know, definitely you want to start repeating it. And I've, I've also um, used different, like I've toyed around with Meet Edgar, which is a particular um, scheduling tool that keeps recycling the posts that you've shared yes um which is great and i so so over time you definitely want to keep sharing them but in that first week i just do like typically three for twitter one for facebook one for linkedin and again it but it, it depends on how active you are if you're really active on facebook and linkedin and you are posting a ton of updates then definitely you can sneak in one or two more because again, if someone's looking at all your profiles all at once, they want they don't want to see just repeats. You know, here's a post, here's a, an update about my blog post. Here's another update about my blog post in slightly different language, and sure. then the next post. You know, so you don't want that. So it depends on how much you have filling in. Like content, social media is about content and conversation. So. My area is the content part. But in between the content part, you need to be having conversations. You need to be doing other things on those social, they're called social media networks, you know. So, so yeah, so my typical answer would be three and then one and one, but it depends on how active you are. I have one client and, you know, so we were doing three for a long time, but then I started to recognize he's not posting anything else. <laughs> so... I'm going to pair back and just do one tweet and, you know, maybe try to get into to, to pipe up now and then on, on Twitter so that it's not just, uh, you know, looking at uh, if someone looks at his account, they're not just seeing all of my teasers, sure. but uh, yeah, so it depends on how active you are, but that's sort of where I start. Okay. Great advice. Great advice. I am just loving your, your, your multiple steps to everything. And I can't wait to drop in these links in the show notes for everyone to be able to go to your website and uh, reference these things you've spoken of, because these are great. And and I'm a methodical person. So checklist or step-by-steps is uh, makes me feel warm and fuzzy. So I appreciate (laughs) that. (laughs) Now, when we get to the, you know, we've written the post, we have this great content created, but it has to have a home. So a website, um, what platforms do you use or what do you, where do you like to publish your content? We could lots of WordPress sites out there. WordPress is, is the, the, I going to say quote unquote, but it's the go-to blogging platform, but you have other sites out there, LinkedIn, you can post uh, your content directly to LinkedIn you have medium. What is your recommendation? Um, maybe for the beginner or even to, to give you a second part to this question, once that blogger is established, they have content going, would you recommend leveraging any of these other newer platforms like medium? Yeah, great question. So, so as far as the home, so 
I do think it's really important that your blog posts have a home that you own. <laughs> so definitely your own website. Um, preferably the same home that the rest of your business website is. So not a separate blog, but actually on the same website. Because that way, first of all, you're not competing with yourself. You're not competing with your own website by having a different um, location that people are going to. Um, and also so that when they're reading your blog post and like, hey, this is awesome, they're one step away from your services page, your contact page, your sign up for my newsletter page, like about me page, all that stuff is right there when they're reading. So definitely, definitely, definitely want your, your content to have a home that you own, that you control, and that is the same as your website. So for that purpose also, I recommend a self-hosted WordPress website. So um, not WordPress.com, but WordPress.org and, you know, with, with a theme. I actually do have a blog post about this. I don't have a short link for you, but um, I can get it to you later. Sure. Um, and it explains why I don't recommend sites like Wix or Weebly um, because you don't own them. You don't have as much control. And um, unless you're a designer, which I suspect you're not, unless your business is design, um, it's probably not going to look um, as professional and, uh, you know, the way that you want it to. And you can spend a lot of time doing it yourself. And I know people that do, but in the end, you've spent a lot of time and I don't think you're going to get the same, the same result as you would from a professional, either professional designer or professional theme. So that's the other thing I recommend is if you are going with wordpress.org that you do purchase a premium theme because these themes, they've got it all figured out for you sure. and it, it looks good and it works properly. It works with other plug, you know, with, with, you don't get a lot of plug-in conflicts, that kind of thing. I explain all this in my blog post. I will definitely get you the link um, because, and I do, but for the absolute beginner and, you know, really, uh, not tech savvy, not wanting to spend a lot or do a lot right off the bat, I do suggest WordPress.com because that way you can then later transition to WordPress.org a lot easier and, you know, it is still part of the same platform. You're going to be uh, more equipped to use WordPress.org as self-hosted if you've already gotten used to the platform. So that's the one um, hosted uh, platform that I would suggest, you know, if you know, if that's where you need to start. Um, so as far as uh, leveraging and as far as posting on the other platforms, so depending on your business, um, I definitely recommend LinkedIn as a place to blog. Um, again, I still recommend having it on your own site first and then reposting it. And um, for myself, I usually wait um, sometimes a week, sometimes a few months. It just depends on where I'm at. But um, with, with, I have other clients where we do it almost simultaneously. Um, and, and I mean, either way, it, you, and you can experiment, but I, but it, what's, what always, what's always amazing to me is people, um, people in my network who really should have seen my updates and who also get my newsletter and so really should have seen these posts, you know, and I'm, I'm like most of us, right? I think everyone reads everything that I put out. Why wouldn't they? You sure. know? But in reality, to, right? <laughs> in reality, people don't always look at the stuff we put out. So I'll put up, we post something on LinkedIn and I'll get these people commenting, liking. Um, it's like they've never seen it. <laughs> so awesome. it is awesome. So I do find, and you know, however the, um, algorithm works and whatever LinkedIn is showing people like I don't I can never figure that out I don't think any of us can but it they, they do seem to get out there so when I put something up when I post something on my LinkedIn blog it does seem to get out there it does seem to get some attention so I do recommend doing that um uh and um as far as medium I have experimented with medium I don't post there quite as often as I do on LinkedIn but I have definitely gotten some some attention there, and the nice thing, and, and you know, there are there are medium experts that you can, I'm sure, talk to um, that know a lot more about it than I do. And there's ways to succeed on medium that I just haven't delved into. Like you know, you can you can actually create a blog, like your own publication 
on LinkedIn, which is a very cool feature that I think, you know, looks, looks really interesting. Haven't done it myself, but I think that's definitely something to look into. Um, and what's nice about medium is that, you know, what I did notice is I was attracting new, new people, completely not a ton, but people who never, ever would have seen my work otherwise have found it on medium. So that's a nice, a really nice, um, you know, as a, as a writer, and I think medium is, is a, a good site for, for, you know, for thought leaders, for writers, for people who are really interested in having uh, sort of a global conversation, really delving into issues. And that's not all of us. You know what, if you're a business owner, you're just, and you're blogging because you want to get more exposure for your business, you want to help people, you want to do, you know, you want to, you provide this service that may not all be as important to you. So I wouldn't put quite as much stock into the time you spend on medium. Um, but if, but, but absolutely once, you know, if, if you're, if you've got everything else, if you're blogging regularly, if you're posting on LinkedIn regularly, then maybe start on medium. I wouldn't make it a priority at the beginning because there's too many things to do. There's just too many things to do. Sure. So they, they do have a fairly good import function, but you will still have to go in probably and do some reformatting, maybe put the picture back in. So it's still going to take you some time. So like I said, if, if you're, if you're really into, into the writing process, into having that conversation, into having those dialogues, then by all means, it's a great platform. But if, if your main goal is getting more business and getting your content out there so that the people who need you can find you, then I'd say stick to the others first until you're really, really consistent with that. And then it maybe look into Medium. Okay. So, so for clarification for everyone start off with the WordPress site that you own and, and have that ownership there. Um, because I, I think that's super important is, is not depending on another platform out there. Um, the housing, your information, it's like putting your, all your money in a bank that, uh, may, you know, you're not certain if it's going to be there in a hundred years or not. It, uh, it, you want to make sure that you have ownership in your content. And so you're stating, WordPress site you own and then reposting to LinkedIn. And then as you get comfortable with that, moving over into medium and reposting your content there. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Beautiful. Hey, Linda, if you have one piece of parting advice for our listening audience, what would that be? Ah, uh, well, just do it. <laughs> just, just start. If this has been an all inspiring to you, I hope that I have, made you understand that it's that it's it's doable i was going to say easy not necessarily easy but it's doable you can do it so please just give it a try you know stick to your main topics and just start because you're going to get so much better at it over time so please just give it a start and uh, and see how it goes that's great advice i think that we hear that quite a bit it's just take action and get started and and do it yeah. Uh, what is the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? Contentmasteryguide.com. Perfect. Nian Noise Nation. We hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Linda. Be sure to go over and check out her website at contentmasteryguide.com. Linda, thank you so much for being on the show today. My pleasure. As always, the show notes from today will be available at neangoldfish.com forward slash podcast. Until next time, this is Justin, Ken, and Linda signing off. Neon Noise Nation, we will see you again next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Neon Noise Podcast. Did you enjoy the podcast? If so, please subscribe, share with a friend, or write a review. We want to cover the topics you want to hear. If you have an idea for a topic you'd like Justin and Ken to cover, connect with us on Twitter at Neon Goldfish or through our website at neongoldfish.com.